Welcome, everyone. We continue our series entitled League of Women Voters Empowering You, a program designed by the League of Women Voters in partnership with Dayton Access Television to provide unbiased, nonpartisan information on issues that are relevant to our friends and neighbors throughout the greater Dayton area. My name is David Bodery. I am a member of the League of Women Voters and your host this evening as we discuss our topic, Empowering You, Understanding Our Connections. Our guest this evening is Dr. Derek Fulward, President of the Dayton Unit of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. Welcome, Derek. Hey, thank you, David, for this opportunity uh, to speak with the League of Women Voters uh, audience. Thank you so much. And obviously, it'll go out to uh, all of the Dayton Access TV audience, so anybody that's watching us, we're glad you're with us tonight. Um, I'm pleased to have a chance to sit down with you and learn more about the history of the NAACP, but also to find those connections between the League and the NAACP. Uh, and I spent some time on your website, and I looked at things, and I realized that your co core goals are actually pretty similar to ours, in that you are to inform, educate, and empower the citizenry as you're pursuing justice and equality for all Americans. Sounds like pretty agreeable kinds of things to do. Yes, absolutely. So could you help and get us started just a little bit of history about the NAACP? Yes, uh, you know, the NAACP uh, was founded uh, back on February 12, 1909. You know, in fact, if you back up about three more years from about, uh, or four more years, from about 05 to 08, uh, there was a organization called the Negro National Committee. Okay. Uh, that was headed by W.E.B. Du Bois uh, as well as Ida B. Wells uh, as the journalists. And uh, it was basically an all-black organization uh, trying to advance the rights of African Americans uh, who were not given their civil and human rights uh, as American citizens. So they were trying to they start the organization uh, and uh, deal what they knew how to do within their power uh, to push the black agenda forward. Mm -hmm. uh, somewhere along the road in 08 and 09, uh, his path crossed with uh, Mary White Ovington, okay. white female, blue eyes. Okay. And, uh, you know, so their paths crossed. Uh, she did not like what she was seeing as it relates to the race riots uh, or, or, or basically race riots and the lynchings, the lynchings more importantly, in Springfield, Illinois. And uh, so uh, she she didn't like that. And, you know, and she said, well, you know what, uh, W.B. Du Bois, let's found an organization, and let's call it the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Uh, because she felt like, well, you know, uh, here's an American citizen, or here are American citizens uh, who are being hung in trees just merely because of the color of their skin. Uh, and she did not appreciate that as a white American uh, inside of these United States of America. So they formed an organization, uh, which later became the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People on February 12, 1909. In fact, the NAACP was founded by a multiracial group of activists, uh, more white people than black people. Uh, there was only a select few African-Americans that was part of the original foundership of the NAACP. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so then if you say, okay, well, how about the leadership, Derek? How about the leadership, Dr. Forward? Well, uh, our first president uh, was uh, Moorfield Story, white male, uh, white hair. Uh, you know, and he, uh, he became our first president and led the organization. In fact, for the first 67 years of our organization's history, all of our uh, presidents were white male. Uh, so from 09 uh, to 75, 76, they were all white male. We got our first African-American president nationally. His name was uh, Dr. W. Montague Cobb. He was in the healthcare industry. Mm -hmm. uh, so from 76 uh, to current day, all of our presidents have either been white male or white female. Uh, why people didn't really understand that or know that early on in the 1900s is because we had a position called executive directors. Okay. Uh, that executive director would be the people that they will see on TV. Okay. Okay. More forward facing. Th yeah, that's right. That's right. So uh, in and a lot of times uh, that individual, Walter White, looked white. So if anybody ever Googled mm -hmm. Walter White, he looks white, but he was in fact African-American. So uh, early on, a lot of people thought that he was white. So he was able to get indoors, listen to the uh, game plans and the strategies planned against African-Americans and take the information back to the organization. And then we wouldn't know how to, at that point in time, chart our strategy and path forward to advance civil and human rights for black Americans. That's so interesting. 
You mentioned a name that I was familiar with because just a, a year ago, the League of Women Voters were celebrating their 100th anniversary of women's right to vote. Mm -hmm. And so Ida B. Wells was instrumental in gaining women, at that time white women, mm -hmm. the right to vote. And so she was active with the women's movement of the time. So she was active with the women's movement, but it sounds like she was also active then with what is now the NAACP. You're absolutely correct. And, you know, so and then even locally here, uh, we were founded on May 10th, 1915. Uh, so uh, merely just six years after the founding of the national organization. Okay. And our organization started the same way by a multiracial group of activists striving to eliminate racial hatred and racial discrimination among all Americans. Um, a lot of people don't know a lot of our foundership locally, but I'm quite certain people know uh, the Reich's family, uh, mm -hmm. Frederick Reich, uh, who owned Reich's department store, uh, Kumler, it later became Reich's Kumler. Mm -hmm. uh, those two individuals are part of our foundership. I'm quite certain people know about the name of NCR, mm -hmm. National Cash Register. Julia Patterson was also one of our original founders okay. of the NAACP here. Julia Patterson. That's right. Is that right? Okay, that's so right. that's the, the spouse of John Patterson? That's that correct. Mean? Okay. Julia Carnell Patterson. All right. That's correct. You know, so she um, uh, she was part of our foundership as well. Rabbi um, David Lefowitz, he was over the Temple right. Israel at that point in time. So, um, in fact, I believe our first president, we have yet to uh, nail this down, but we think that our first president, who his name was James Farrell, he was a letter carrier, we, we, we can't find a picture of him, so if anybody knows, uh, mm -hmm. or has a picture of James Farrow, F-A-R-R-O-W. Uh, hopefully they will be able to look that person up and be able to see if they can find a picture of him. He was a letter carrier uh, in 1915. And he was our first president. We, we heard he was Caucasian, but we're not sure of that because we don't have a photo. That's so uh, interesting. So, uh, yeah. but, but as part of our foundership, our foundership was in fact uh, multiracial from its inception as a local organization. And then if you uh, chart down the path a little bit, we had, uh, in fact, one white, oh, I'm sorry, one African-American female as part of our foundership, well, as part of our presidency. So there's been 33 local presidents here. Um, okay. I'm actually the 33rd local president wow. of the Dayton unit NAACP. Um, so in 100 years. In 100 years. 33. 100, 106 years. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Yeah, so there's been 33 presidents. And really, uh, when you really think about it, it's really amazing uh, to have an organization uh, that's 106 years old that's led off of volunteers. Uh, so myself, as a president, I get paid zero dollars and zero cents to do this work. Right. The Lord has blessed each one of these, the 33 presidents with certain knowledge, skills, and abilities to help people. And uh, we have given of our time uh, to be able to seek the cause of justice for the American people in our community. And likewise, for all of our other uh, vice presidents, the vice presidents who's led this organization, right. everybody in the organization is volunteers. Uh, we have maybe about five people that's at our office mm -hmm. uh, that uh, actually make certain that the doors are open every day so people can come in and get service. They get a small stipend. And okay. when I'm talking about a small stipend, believe me, uh, it's a Cheerio. <laughs> Wow, I'd love the, to learn about it. And of mm -hmm. course, uh, slightly older than the League of Women Voters, and I'm thinking about all the overlaps between your organization mm -hmm. and the league that, that I represent and belong to. And of course, there's quite a few connections. Uh, I'm involved currently with uh, what we call a, sur a, a research project for the league at the state level mm -hmm. related to criminal justice reform. Okay. And specifically, reentry is an area that I'm focusing on. And I know that that's an area that the NAACP also has concern and care about. And there are other areas too, education, climate, mm -hmm. housing, health, labor, legal, all these areas. So there's all these connections between us. All right, and I just wanna make one point of reference. Uh, we had one, during our 33 years of presidents here locally, uh, there was one female president, uh, which is Viola T. Waiters, uh, Viola T. Lewis Waiters. Okay. Uh, or let me see, Leah, Lewis, Lewis Waiters, Viola T. Lewis Waiters. Uh, she was with the YWCA at that oh, time. Right. Uh, and she was one of our local presidents. So uh, as I'm here on the League of Women Voters show, I want to make certain that, uh, uh, that the League of Women Voters know that we have had a female president here in Dayton, Ohio. Well, they will appreciate that. So will my <laughs> wife and my, my mother-in-law for sure. Yes, yes. Um, so often, you know, I think we hear about the NAACP, but we don't necessarily understand all the things they do. 
Anything you want to share that you're working on now that you're excited to share? Uh, well, well, let's just look at this for a second. So, so just a second ago, you were talking about the interconnections mm -hmm. uh, uh, between the NAACP and the league. Uh, as I viewed uh, several of your initiatives, uh, such as criminal justice, uh, economic development, education, health, political action, uh, that's just one short of what we consider our 21st century game changers. With the NAACP, we have about 19 different standing committees. Uh, six of those standing committees are, are what we call our 21st century game changers. And five of those, the ones I just named, right. are a part of uh, those game changers. So every local unit, the 2,200 units across the country, have been charged with ensuring that they have a, uh, a chair for each one of those committees and that they're active in each one of those committees because those committees are the drivers. But there's one additional one that I don't see among your list that is our six game changers. Okay. And uh, that is youth and young adult engagement oh. uh, because uh, our youth are, are, are uh, current activists. Absolutely. Uh, you know, these are the individuals that continue to lead uh, this, you know, this nation, this country. Now, as we just saw uh, on TV just the other day, uh, another African-American killed at the hands of law enforcement mm -hmm. uh, sleep on a couch uh, and then uh, due to a no knock warrant. And we're going to be talking with our new police chief regarding trying to get rid of no-knock warrants here inside of our community. We don't want a devastation like that. Someone sleep, you enter inside of that gentleman's home, he's laying there on a the couch, he pulls up because he's asleep, he don't know what's going on, he has a gun, and yes he has a gun in his hand, home. but he's yeah. inside of his home, yeah. and, uh, and he has a CCW, and now he's no longer a part of the living inside of these United States of America, on this earth. Right. You know, so uh, having no knock warrants is something that as an organization that we're challenging, uh, uh, you know, in each one of our local municipalities. But I will be meeting uh, very soon with our new police chief to talk about no knock warrants inside of our community. We don't want an accident right. like that happening inside of our community. None of us do. And I appreciate the work then that you're doing to achieve that. Uh, and man, I keep thinking about the ways in which the league and the NAACP might begin to think about ways we could work together and, and actually help each other to achieve these things. And the youth, that is absolutely our future, isn't it? And absolutely. So without the youth, and that's where, boy, I got to take that back to my board, right, and say, hmm, we need to think about something. And uh, you know, as I kind of look through this stuff again, I, I, I kind of see uh, where we can have synergies, right? Uh, so let's just look at, uh, you know, as I look at criminal justice, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's dealing with basically the court systems uh, and the police officers. Some we just got through talking about just a second ago regarding no knock warrants. So we have a, uh, a you know leader at our office who was a retired. Uh, well, actually, he was a um, a former Dayton police officer, but retired chief of police at Wilberforce University. Okay. So he has a lot of knowledge, background on dealing with the criminal justice system. And uh, and in fact, when George Floyd was murdered. Uh, last year or two years ago now, uh, we, um, uh, we implemented an eight-point strategy on criminal justice reform and police accountability, right. uh, working with 21, 22 different law enforcement agen agencies throughout Montgomery County, Ohio. So when I think about that particular component uh, of, uh, of one of the league's initiatives, that's something that we can definitely work on uh, together. Uh, economic development, mm -hmm. uh, you know, being here in a food desert, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we only have, a matter of fact, I just got off, a, um, off of a call today, that a board that I sit on, uh, and um, we only have one major grocery store in Dayton proper, mm -hmm. and that's Kroger's. Uh, you know, so uh, outside of Kroger's, you have, uh, you know, the Gym City Market that the community came in and, uh, you know, put money towards, and so did Corporate America put money towards having a co-op. Uh, I paid my money as well uh, to be a part of that co-op. But we need to make certain that we have more than just one major grocery store uh, providing produce uh, and fresh fruit, foods and fruits uh, for our citizenry here. Absolutely. So when I think about economic development, uh, you know, that's something that we can definitely partner on as well. For sure. Uh, you mentioned the food deserts and of course Amaha Selassie, a colleague of mine from Sinclair, mm -hmm. who's been on this program and mm -hmm. we've had a conversation, it was at the table across the way there, uh, talking about what is a food desert and then understanding it. This was before Gem City Market opened, mm -hmm. but obviously he had plans and together the community has worked to develop those things and that's an improvement, but it's not enough. It's, so it's definitely not enough. I mean, when you're thinking about, I mean, I know, just think about this. 
on the west side of Dayton, you have a Kroger's that's on Siementhaler Avenue. Mm -hmm. That Kroger is meeting the needs of the citizenry of Harrison Township, Trotwood, Jefferson Township, Dayton, uh, and then the communities of like um, Westwood, Residence Park, Northern Hills. I mean, I, you know, when you think about, I mean, just the different cities that one store right. it's is, not enough. is not enough. No. You know, so uh, so it, that's, that's something that we need to continue to work on, as well as meaningful job opportunities. When I'm thinking about economic development, I'm not talking about livable wage jobs. I mean, yes, we push for livable jobs, right? That's something that we do. But how about meaningful job opportunities? How about promotional opportunities within the corporate structure? Sure. You know, when we look at corporate America, and I don't care where you go, what corporate office you go to, when you look at the leadership, you see mostly white male as part of that leadership. Uh, you, you know, we need to start tying, uh, 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 you know, tying their their bonuses, tying their um, uh, their income to diversity metrics. Right. There need to be some diversity metrics inside of their, uh, you know, inside of the leaders at all levels of management, whether that's top management, executive management, middle management. We need to start doing those kinds of things. So. Uh, so those are things that we can continue to work on. Education, sure. you know, uh, very, very important that our children are educated, getting the best quality education uh, so that they can compete in the global workforce. You know, they, these are definitely things that we can help. Uh, you know, we as the NAACP, when COVID-19 hit mm. uh, a couple of years back, we were out there first. We actually met with uh, the health commissioner. We put on a town hall with the health commissioner as well as several other healthcare professionals. Uh, and if anybody want to view what that was, it's right on our website. You know, because we want to make certain that people understood about this disease. This, uh, and I like to call it uh, the uh, the unseen enemy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, you know, it's a you know, it's an enemy that you can't see uh, that has killed nearly almost what a. a more than three quarters of a million people. Right, 900,000 last I yeah, heard. Yeah, yes, yes, yeah. so almost a million people. Right. So these are things that we can tap in on and work together on. And then political action, of course. You know, that's what y'all do, do. Hey, hands down, League of Women Voters does a great job. Uh, you know, and you're putting, putting those uh, reports together, right. uh, you know, getting all the voter guides and things like that. Right. Uh, you know, that's, you know, and maybe, just maybe, because we have yet to put together a and this is something that we're, you know, that we've been talking about at the Dayton Union NAACP is putting together a scorecard. Oh. And maybe that's something that the NAACP here locally and the League of Women Voters can work on together. And that, you know, that's what we can start planning immediately is putting together a scorecard for all of our local elected officials. And making that scorecard not swaying one way or the other, because a lot of times when you look at uh, legislative report cards, if you go to uh, the area, you know, the, you know, the Chamber of Commerce, mm -hmm. Uh, the Democrats are going to score bad on that, and the Republicans are going to score good. If you go to the NAACP scorecard, Republicans are going to score bad on that, Democrats are going to score good. I'm talking about having a fair, because we can set the model, yeah, having a fair, non, a right. true nonpartisan uh, legislative report card for our local community. Uh, and, I, and, and that's something that we can work on immediately. I appreciate that. And, you know, there's just so much work that needs to be done in a democracy. And yet so many citizens, I think, think that it's politics is something you watch, you don't participate in. Mm -hmm. And yet we would say often at the League, democracy is not a spectator sport. You've got to be involved. You That's have right. to be willing to call the mayor's office or call the, the congressman or call uh, an elected official, call Mike DeWine's office to be able to say, look, these things aren't happening as they were promised or as we think they ought to and get people to begin to pay more attention. And yeah, maybe the squeaky wheel gets the grease, but mm -hmm. then maybe that's what makes democracy work, right? Is a little bit more active engagement, which so, is important. It's extremely important. And that's why I'm kind of glad that uh, over the past uh, month, I believe when they announced, uh, when, the, uh, when the Montgomery County Board of Elections announced that individuals will have to actually run for uh, precinct, to run to be oh, precinct right. captains mm -hmm. uh, versus them being appointed Mm -hmm. uh, by the chairs of the political parties. Right. Now you have a true democracy. So now anybody uh, can run for those particular, now before anybody could run before, but then if there was a vacant seat, somebody 
who doesn't even live inside my precinct could be appointed right. by the county chair. And then all that does is you know, sway the votes of the party. You know, so now only only the people who actually reside in that precinct uh, uh, has to run for those offices or those offices remain vacant. Right. You know, so I, so I think that was very good, a very good thing that the uh, Board of Elections did. And a little bit more representative then of the that, That's correct, which yes. Which is good. Yes. I have one question that I've really been trying to make sure that I get to, and that is that often, and I teach at Sinclair, so I hear students saying things like, hey, they don't feel that voting matters. And like, what does it matter? Uh, things are gonna happen without my vote. Uh, and I guess I wanna hear what you think about why does it matter? If you're talking to a young person who's gonna turn 18 before the next election, what, what could you suggest to them in terms of why they should vote? Well, one thing I want to first suggest oh, yeah. is that if you're a parent and or a grandparent and or a guardian who is taking care of someone who is about to turn 18 of low, in your voting age, right. I would encourage you to make that be their birthday gift. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, get them to the polls to be a registered voter. Start them off in the beginning uh, when they become of age to be a registered voter. And then after that, now you got to start teaching them about how to be civically engaged right. inside of their community. Because if they are not civically engaged inside the community, uh, that's a recipe for a disaster. And in fact, it's a recipe for what we've seen uh, under 45's leadership. Okay? I just said it like that. So at the end of the day, uh, it becomes everyone's voice does matter. But if everyone has those same sentiments and say that my vote won't count, my vote won't count. Now, if you add up how many people had to say that, now you're getting into tens of thousands of people. And yes, maybe your vote won't count because some people are saying the same thing that you're saying and y'all not voting. So basically you get what you got. Yeah. You know, so I would encourage you no matter what, make certain that you vote in every single election primaries, special elections, gen general elections, uh, whatever election is, make it a habit uh, to go to the polls and vote. Understand the issues. Get a League of Women Voters uh, 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 guide. Uh, yeah. guide. Uh, understand where these individuals stand. You know, so we cannot accept from younger people that their vote don't count. We have to be, basically be able to educate them uh, to, um, to make them understand this is how you change things. Right. You know, so if we're not educating, shame on us. So we need to make certain that we're educating them. Uh, so, you know, we have uh, five different youth groups within the, you know, under the umbrella of the NAACP. So we have our Little John Junior Youth Council, that's kids ages one through 13. We have our Dayton Youth Council, kids ages 14 up to 25 if they're still in college. Okay. We have our uh, Move Forward Third Good Marshall High School chapter. Uh, you know, we have our Central State University uh, College uh, chapter. We have our Wright State University College chapter. In all of these individuals, you don't have a Sinclair chapter. No, we don't have a Sinclair chapter. Do we need to work on that? Uh, uh, we may need to work <laughs> on that. Now, maybe that's something else we can partner we can on. That. You know, so so as I think about that, I say, okay, well, if we have a situation whereas we have all these youth groups, they're taught uh, uh, to actually have their own elections. Oh, so, right. so these individuals are actually elected to office uh, to serve as president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, executive committee member. So we're doing our part as an organization for 106 years in, in, you know, inside this community because, or however old those particular youth organizations are. So even at the earliest age of one through 13, those individuals go to the polls. You know, they actually have a ballot. They go to the polls. They pick their leaders. So we're teaching them, right. and and that's something that we need we need to continue to do. And something that our new mayor uh, implemented uh, even before he was mayor, marching those kids uh, over that bridge from uh, the, what, the, what was that the RTA Transit Center right. uh, over to the polls uh, to vote, showing our high school students the importance of being first time voters being uh, showing them the importance of being able to vote. So these are things that we have to continually do and, and you know, and educate them to say, hey, there is no time to not vote. Right. You must do it because your vote will make a powerful difference. It's so powerful and I appreciate that. The state and the Dayton League of Women Voters is working through their own reflection on diversity, equity and inclusion uh, to think about and consider like what are we doing with respect to racial justice uh, and uh, equity 
it includes, and we recognize there's structural change that needs to pl take place, mm -hmm. but there's also relational change that needs to take place too. Mm -hmm. And so changes that need to occur at the local, the state, even the national level. Um, we've got a minute left or so. Uh, are there s changes, structural or relational changes that you see that you want us to really focus on first from your perspective? Well, uh, here's what I hear. I don't know, maybe you can educate me. Uh, I hear that there are not a, a lot of African Americans as part of the leadership in the League of Women Voters. That I, is true. We okay. have some, but probably there's room for more. Okay, so so I would say start there. Uh, you know, start to look within yourself uh, to say within your own organization, say hey, how can we improve this? Because myself, even with the NAACP, I ve I make very strategic moves to make certain that I do that, and I'm very uh, uh, strategic and very pointed uh, to saying that I want to be inclusive even as the right. NAACP. That's a great place for us to begin. I appreciate that. Um, we are running out of time. Uh, there's so much more we could talk about, and I knew that was gonna be the case. We could go another 30 minutes, I'm sure. We live in a democracy, and that democracy is messy. It's challenging. Mm -hmm. Right now, honestly, it's a polarized one. It requires us to be engaged and to be active, not passive bystanders in the process. Mm -hmm. So there's tons of work to be done and work that still needs to be done as we work to create a more perfect union. I appreciate the work that you've been involved in as the 33rd, 33rd president of yes. the Dayton unit of the NAACP and for their 106 ongoing years of work in support of your efforts to advance the civic and, uh, uh, yeah, the civic opportunity and uh, really opportunity for the, the people of color in our community. I want to thank Dr. Derek Forward, President of the Dayton Unit of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Uh, obviously, I've enjoyed our conversation. Uh, it seems like we need to have more, maybe more often. I appreciate your suggestion that the League needs to look inward and think about what can we do to be more inclusive and to make sure that our board, our leadership represents the community that we serve. Um, the League of Women Voters encourages everyone to participate in each election, as you suggested, and if you have further questions, either about how to become a registered voter or perhaps how to participate in un upcoming uh, voting opportunities or even have insights or things you'd like to share with us about the program we do on this program, please contact the lead League office by emailing league at lwvdayton.org or call the office at 937 228-4041. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, David. Thank you all for sharing your evening with us. Uh, please uh, stay well and be an active participant in the democracy that requires our participation.